I'm here to introduce Thomas Sprinkmeyer, who's talking about remote management systems, so I'll just hand straight over to him. Thank you. And thank you all for showing up. Um, bit redundant, my name is Thomas Sprinkmeyer and I'm here to talk about remote management. It's a project that I've been working on for work. I work at Ebor Computing, a South Australian company. Uh, we do um, custom software. Um, used to be a fairly heavy uh, defense focus, but we're branching out into um, more uh, areas than that. Uh, the uh, top left hand is a taxi dispatch system, which introduces all new areas of joy and pain. Uh, if, ever, if anyone ever offers you a job as a help desk for a cabbie at four in the morning, don't take it. <laughs> but unless you want to learn wonderful new ways of using the English language. But um, eball Computing is about um, 40 or 50 people, and uh, uh, mainly South Australia, some interstate, a variety of projects, and uh, they've um, kindly agreed to let me give this talk on something they've kindly agreed to pay me to do, so doubly blessed. Uh, this talk is about a requirement that we had for remote controlling a bunch of PCs where there is no traditional copper service. There is no power, there is no network. Um, we need a real-time access, we need to be able to transfer files. We didn't have a schedule, so we, um, it was going to be ad hoc, as in theoretically somebody could come along and say, I need to talk to it in five minutes time. And uh, we don't have any locals for support. Now, I don't know how well you can see this picture, but that spike there is a 40-foot shipping container. And that is the big truck that just brought it. And this is all empty. And there's a lot more of that empty on the other side. Um, I was told there would be cows in this paddock, but I was lied to. Uh, <laughs> It was actually uh, the first time a cow has entered into the requirements of a um, piece of st um, a project I've done because the supports for the solar panel had to be cow-proof. <laughs> How many people can say that? <coughs> the obvious solution, of course, what do you think of last? And um, fortunately it didn't work because um, when I tried this, if it had worked, I would have wasted um, a good deal of time. But anyway, um, this project uh, was very broad rather than deep. Um, I got to play with a lot of new technologies. I got to play with a lot of things I thought I knew something about. And I got to learn an awful lot about uh, how things work and uh, yeah, how things actually work as opposed to what the packaging says will work. For example, oh, sorry, th th this is a system we came up with when um, Python let me down. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A control circuit in the middle, um, that contains the Arduino that seems to be causing the greatest buzz at the moment. Uh, a solar panel charging a lead acid battery, powering a, um, an ultra mobile PC, which uses a 3G modem to talk to us. Uh, 3G modem didn't, uh, the 3G modem, the plan we're on, you don't get a world routable address, so you have to do evil things with tunnels. Uh, so that gives us our basic connectivity and that meets the requirements of being able to connect at any time. Uh, we then have a diesel generator which we can remotely start from the circuit and that will power our PCs which we can then hopefully route through and talk to. Um, oh, one of the requirements I failed to mention is we did not want to have any kind of lock-in. Uh, we we've had some projects in the past where we've had a particular technology that didn't work very well, and uh, yeah, I, I don't have to tell you guys about lock-in, do I? Um, we've also tried uh, commercial off-the-shelf, and we discovered that there are degrees of commercial off-the-shelf, and some of the commercial off-the-shelf stuff you get really sucks. So um, if we're going to go COTS, it's got to be high volume COTS, um, not some of the other things that I won't mention. So anyway, that's uh, very simple. Don't take long. Be done over a fortnight. Until you learn what 120 watt 12 volt actually means when you buy it on the solar panel. It means that your open circuit voltage, which is kind of useless because you don't get any power there, is up to 21.8 volts. And your short circuit current is up to 7.14 amps. And this is in standard conditions, which I believe only exist in a laboratory. 
and anywhere in between you have a performance of the solar panel somewhere between these two lines. Um, this line represents darkness, this line represents bright light, the line moves up and down as the light happens, uh, as you get more light, and depending on what current you draw from the solar panel, you get a certain amount of voltage. So uh, what you should ha ideally have when you have a solar panel is something called a peak power tracking unit, which tries to match the voltage you want with the voltage the panel is prepared to give you in order to maximize the power. So that's 21.8 volts there. If I'm using 12 volts, I'm actually using, oh sorry, uh, voltage times current equals power, so effectively the area of this rectangle is the power you get. So if you're drawing 12 volts, you might get a bit more current, but you have a smaller area, therefore you have less power. So um, uh, one thing that isn't in this one, but one thing that's good to have is something called a peak power unit. Uh, solar panels introduced me to another interesting requirement. They should be aligned uh, according to your latitude to catch the maximum amount of sunlight. Except in some parts of Australia, where if they're flat, they're harder to see. If they're not flat, they're easier to see and people use them for target practice. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out when they're flat, bird poop is a lot easier to clean off and get rid of than bullet holes. <clears throat> Hopefully the cows are not armed and this will not be a problem. So now I have a solar panel and now I have a 12 volt battery, <coughs> 100 ampere hours. Well actually the voltage coming out of a 12 volt battery is between 10.5 and 12.7 volts, up to 14.4 volts if you're charging it. Your mileage will vary. The 100 amp hour quoted number is actually all the way full, which you'll never get, to all the way empty, which you should never do. and you end up, or I ended up with, because the charging circuit isn't ideal, with about half of that capacity actually usable. The problem is that lead-acid batteries um, are ideally start charged in three stages. The first one is a bulk state, where you feed them up to a limit of current uh, up until, 14 po uh, until the cell voltage reaches 14.4 volts. That typically gives you an 80% charge. That's all I'm doing, because the circuit I have is very primitive. The next stage you usually do is, is an absorption stage where you maintain 14.4 volts across the battery until the charging current drops off and that should give you 98% of your usable charge. That's very difficult to do in a solar system unless you have some way of fixing the sun in the sky. The last stage is what's called float charge and this is what all the UPS batteries are at. It's when you maintain it at 13.4 volts indefinitely and that gives you 100%. So basically, I'm starting off here. Oh, if you take them less than about 30% charge, despite the fact they're called deep cycle, they will die quickly. So I'm actually going from 80 to 30% charge. So I'm getting half of, my ch half of the rated capacity. Um, yeah, oh, uh, your mileage will vary. Uh, just big, big, big disclaimer. Do not plug these numbers into your system. Lead acid batteries are deceptively complex. Everybody puts different secret ingredients in, uses different alignment of the panels and God knows what, and uh, that affects those voltages, as does temperature and vibration and the phase of the moon and every other thing under the sun. So does only charging the bulk stage <coughs> affect the battery level? Uh, Yes, you, yes you do. When you store a battery for a long time, you should always float charge it and either keep it on float or you know, top it up periodically. So yeah, that, that, uh, thank you very much for the question. I should point out, if you have questions, please ask them. Um, yeah, uh, one of the things about lead acid batteries is they have a limited life. Um, if you mistreat them, that life will decrease and uh, the, the capacity they can hold will decrease. I mean, everyone's familiar with that. Rechargeable batteries suck. Um, also, there are, uh, be careful, there are three main kinds of batteries. There are the, the car battery. Now, they are designed to give you an almighty kick to un unstick your engine, a lot of current to crank it, and then that's it. That's all they do. And then they want to be charged up again. 
If you try to deep cycle them, you will kill them very quickly. On the other hand, you have the deep cycle batteries, which is what I have. They have more lead in them. They are very heavy, even when empty. And they can sustain deeper discharges more often before they also die. So, um, yeah, if you want to do something like that, make, you, make sure you get the right kind of battery. UPS batteries are the wrong kind of battery because they're supposed to live at float charge most of their life. And then when the power fails, they give you all they have in a couple of minutes, just long enough to shut down. So, um, yeah, the joys. Um, the other thing, I've got a plot here of energy density. The uh, lead acid batteries are right there in the corner. You have lithium polymer and all these exotic kind of batteries. And then you have things like diesel fuel, which is back in the thing where we just had the keynote. Um, energy density is very low compared to fossil fuels. So uh, the, the battery I have is actually, 33 kilograms and it's it's heavy and that's only a hundred amp hours and it only gives me a, a day or two depending on how well it's charged the diesel generator can run for ages <laughs> not long enough though okay so yes I don't know if The um, yeah, the next uh, the next blob on the thing is the 3G modem. Um, it is relatively slow, relative of course being a relative term, uh, especially uploads because um, de depending on where you are and what kind of coverage you get, you will either get HSDPA, which is high speed download packet access, or it drops all the way down to GPRS, General Packet Radio Service. So you're going from sort of megabits per second to kilobits per second download. Upload is always really, really bad, which is actually a problem for us because we have these systems, they're doing things, they're, they're acquiring stuff, and then we want, to, we want to download it, but this thing, of course, is uploading it, which is where it has next to no bandwidth. Uh, they're also incredibly expensive. Um, $150 per gigabyte after you use your allowance is, is typical. Um, the telco I went with is of, um, well, it's the only one that had coverage in that area, so I didn't have much of a choice, but it was the best one available. <coughs> uh, yeah, efficient access. Um, you don't have a lot of bandwidth. It's very expensive to use it, so um, one of the requirements was efficient access. Uh, I did not want to put up a VPN, so I actually put up a whole bunch of SSH tunnels. Uh, part of the reason was I did not want machines either side to start getting delusions of grandeur and start chattering across the link and, you know, advertising cups printers and, and, <laughs> and wins routing information and God knows whatever else. So it's like, well, this is the SSH port, that's open. If you know how to talk to that, you get bandwidth. If not, go away. Uh, I mentioned you get a non-routable IP address, uh, 10 dot something. So what I have is the device making a connection to a server with a static IP address, setting up a reverse SSH tunnel, or two or three, and that's how I contact the device. So... Yeah, but that's still going. Oh, sorry, the question was, uh, the comment was, you can do SSH multiplexing so you can have multiple sessions through the one tunnel. I believe, though, that that is, if I'm talking to you as a server, I can reuse that for more outgoing connections. What I'm effectively doing, I'm a 3G modem, I'm talking to you, setting up a reverse tunnel. So if somebody wants to talk to me, they've got to talk to you and tunnel back to me. Yeah. Simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you can, yeah. you can do that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, oh, sorry, when I said multiple tunnels, I set up one tunnel and then I keep reusing that port. But I actually set up a tunnel that gets re-tunneled to the machine that I'm managing. And I'm also setting up a tunnel for uh, a couple of the services that are running on there. <laughs> so, um, Depending on the telco you're using, if you ask them really nicely, you'll tell them why you need a uh, roundable IP, you may be able to give them an Optus 
Like if Bolt gives you a round like that on 3G, Vodafone will give you one if you ask really nicely. Or if you don't have to, it will give you one. The... You change your APN and it will just work. You don't actually have to ask. Okay. The, the, the comment was made that some of the uh, uh, friendlier ISPs will give you a static IP address if you ask nicely. I do not have the luxury of choosing ISPs because of coverage issues. And, uh, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Starting with a T? Starting with a T? Yes, I believe it is. <laughs> I did actually see it. Yes, I did actually see a blog post about that um, uh, in preparation. Okay. Oh, that is good. Please take my card. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, very broad, not very deep. Really hoping to learn stuff here. So uh, I just did. I just paid for my trip. Um, yeah. The the link occasionally crashes. Um, I don't know why, but all I do know is if I unplug the modem and plug it in again, it, it usually works again. No matter what else I do, it usually doesn't work again, including rebooting the machine or anything like that. So um, I've got the USB modem on a... Are there any USB people here? Because what I'm about to say will cause you pain. No, it's not a powered hub. That, would, that wouldn't cause you much pain. I just use a relay to cut the power line. <laughs> it's cruel and it's horrible, but it works. And yes, if I had a powered hub and if I could remotely command the hub to come up and down, that would be better, but um, what I have works. So yeah, when I get one of these outages, and I had one on Monday and started to panic, um, I just toggle the power line on the modem, and uh, if you do it enough times, and if you wait enough times, and if you think happy thoughts, it will eventually come back. Um, Oh, uh, the question was, how do I tell it that? Um, this is all controlled by the Ultra Mobile PC. If I can risk going back. So uh, the Arduino controls the relays. The Ultra Mobile PC controls the Arduino. And the reason that squiggly little line goes through here is because <coughs> one of the relays here cuts the power when I tell it to. So this thing here, once an hour in a cron job, says, am I on the net? I'm not. I'll just toggle the power and try again. Well, actually, it tries again first, and if that doesn't work, it toggles the power and tries again. So, um, yeah, uh, it's remote. There's no support. It, much as possible, has to look after itself. Um, yeah, uh, the 3G modems are incredibly Windows friendly, which is not to say Penguin hostile. Uh, there's no official support although uh, some of the ISPs will link to pages where they say, oh, we don't support it, but this guy figured out how. Go and bug him. <laughs> um, what I found I had to do is disable the PIN request because I um, couldn't enter the PIN. So if you disable the PIN request, it pretty much just becomes a modem and you can use it. Um, one of the devices I used also has a fake CD mode. Uh, when you first connect it, it pretends to be a CD which contains your Windows and Mac drivers, which is really Windows friendly. But if you're on Linux, the first thing you then have to do is eject the CD so you can start using it as a modem. But you can actually disable it. Oh, and uh, the status page that tells you how long, how much bandwidth you've used, this incredibly expensive bandwidth, is massively out of date according to the disclaimers and only works in IE. So <laughs> So, yeah. It's actually rather interesting because I took a deal with a provider that's down, like an ISP, that's actually got wholesale access through 3G. Our radius data is totally different to the provided CDR records from the mobile <laughs> provider, and the online web page that people use is totally different to that again. So well, all three totally different. But that is the whole point. You have choice. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't like those numbers, try these. <laughs> Unfortunately, the guy who writes the bills also gets choice. So. One comment. Why is it that phone companies seem to be the single most determined entities on the planet to make people hate using telephones? <laughs> I don't understand that. Anyway, so we have the 3G modem. We have the control circuit. I actually graduated as an electronic engineer, and this is the first serious bit of electronic engineering I've done in a very, very long time. Um, 
so the control circuit sort of sits in the middle of everything and its job is to charge the batteries. Um, it's got the main battery, the big hulking lead acid battery. Uh, we we want to keep the um, diesel generator starter motor battery charged as well. Not much point pressing the button and it doesn't crank over. And we want to keep the ultra mobile PC fat and happy. Um, we have to provide regulated power supplies to all those things and, and, uh, and the Arduino as well. As I said, the input voltage can be 10.5 on a flat battery to 21.8 on, on a sunny day. So somewhere in here you have to try to regulate that to something that's not going to blow up your stuff. Um, the ultra mobile PC I'm using wants 9.7 volts. If you give it much less than that, it refuses to use it. If you give it much more than that, you release the magic smoke. <laughs> so um, apart from charging batteries, it uh, does digital I.O., a bunch of relays here, and it does analog input, so um, monitoring the battery state. Uh, what's not shown here is this big connector and that big connector plug into the Arduino, which um, has all the brains. It has the brains, I have the looks. <laughs> no one laughed, you must agree with me. <laughs> Um, I haven't, uh, have I had problems with the relays melting or locking shut? No. Or welding shut? Or welding shut? Um, the, the, yeah, I haven't had that problem. Um, the heaviest current I've run through, uh, the relays I'm using are 250 volt AC, 10 amp rated. So they're big, big things. And uh, the heaviest current I've seen is here, which is just after the solar input. And um, that was sort of five to seven volts. And that's a, like on a really bright day with a really flat battery and you turn it on and lots of current rushes in for a bit. Um, I haven't had any problem and I hope I'm not jinxing myself by saying that. <laughs> solid state relays, yes. Um, actually talking about those a bit later. Up to, up to 22 solid state relays, yes. Was so the... If I said volts instead of amps, then yes, I meant amps instead of volts. <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, you have choice. You can pick one or the other. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, the relays are rated at 10 amps, and the biggest I've ever switched with them is 7 amps. And um, no, in that, that's not an inductive load, so it shouldn't cause too much arcing. So um, I'm pretty, um, pretty happy the relays will be okay. Like I said, I hope I'm not jinxing myself. Um, yeah, so that's the control circuit. This is the Arduino. It is cute as anything. It is fantastic. It's based on an Atmel processor. It has digital I.O. It has memory. It has blinking lights. And if you really want to know about these, go to the tutorial on Thursday afternoon. Um, they come in different flavors. The one I've got here you plug in USB, it has a USB to RS-232 converter, and it just becomes a, a serial port on your device, which is very easy to talk to. Um, analog input, digital I.O. Some of the... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, Lock-in, not a problem. It's open hardware, there are clones, you can download the schematics, you can build your own. People have built their own. Uh, I think in the tutorial people are bringing free Duinos instead of Arduinos. So um, uh, this is not high volume COTS, which would have been nice, but it is open, so it is not going to lock us in. Um, yeah. Uh, if, if, if you use a serial uh, port in production, uh, do you have any problems with rebooting and that um, the bootloader is making a new downloading program? Uh, the question was, uh, by default the... Um, the Arduino comes with a bootloader that when it first resets, it expects to be given a new program to run. They call them sketches. Um, if you're, by default, it will reset when you toggle the DTR line, and by default, when your computer reboots, it will toggle the DTR line, and it'll reset your Arduino, and then the Arduino will sit there for a couple of seconds and say, oh, do you have anything new for me to run? Um, there is a way around that. that you can you can hoik out a capacitor or, or something, and uh, then it won't do that. 
Um, the resetting isn't a problem for me because the, uh, the Triple E doesn't reset often and the software that's running on here is written so that it doesn't really care. It's a very simple state machine and it just says, oh, I'm alive, I should be charging that battery and this is how I'll do it. So it doesn't care. Um, Will it send the signal before the machine is loaded, the FTDR drive? I do not know. I do not care. I'm it not works. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that, uh, that's possible. I, I don't know. Um, that's the, the honest answer. Uh, there are various uh, software hacks you can do to get around the computer toggling the line. There's the hardware hack of hawking out the thing. Um, you could actually rewrite it to ignore, well, no, sorry, it's a reset line, so you can't rewrite it to ignore it. But you could change the, the, the timeout in the bootloader so that it doesn't wait for quite as long before deciding it's got to get on with life. Um, what I have is minimal modifications to anything, and it works. So I'm happy with that. <laughs> uh, obviously, if you have different requirements, you might need something else. Um, yeah, oh yeah, sorry, so we have USB, we have power. This version has a little jumper to tell you where to get power from. The new version um, does it automatically. It'll either take power from USB or the external source, whatever's available. A reset, little lights that blink, it's cute. Um, yeah, just the, the, the digital I.O. pins. Um, the tri-state pins, you can have them as input or output. And if you choose to have them as input, you can have them as high impedance or as tied to the 5 volt rail. I sort of try to represent that with a schematic. I, I don't know how much sense that makes to anybody. But um, very flexible. And uh, some of them can also be allocated as an RS-232 port, pulse switch modulation, which is effectively analog output. Some of them can be used to trigger interrupts within the machine. Uh, one of them is tied to a LED, so you can blink lights and keep your audience amused. And uh, the hardware supports SPI, but the software doesn't. So um, they're very, very flexible. Uh, two of the pins are actually um, almost dedicated to talk to the USB FTDI. Um, there is code out there to run a software RS-232 decoder on any other two pins. But... Um, because it's software, you've got to kind of, kind of be waiting for the bytes. You know, you, it doesn't just happen in the background for you automatically. So, um, yeah, uh, supply up to 40 milliamps. It's enough to drive a lead, and um, rather nice input. So, this is the remote. This is the PC we're controlling. Um, this is not a shipping container surrounded by cows. This is actually the shed at my boss's place. Um, we haven't deployed yet, but um, there's the, the, um, the PC I'm controlling. This picture was taken through the webcam on the Ultra Mobile PC. And uh, cross fingers, I'll be taking another picture later today. I have full TCP access. Um, as I said, I've um, kind of limited myself by not setting up a VLAN to just SSH, but that's enough for SSH and SCP. Um, I've run PuTTY and WinSCP, so you, your, your ultimate client can be Windows or Linux. Um, about the only challenge with this thing is you have to remotely turn it on and off. Now, one way to do that is to set the BIOS to say, whenever you see 240 volts, turn yourself on, and then turn on the generator, and in theory the thing will fire up. But then if it doesn't fire up for any reason, you've got to turn the generator back off, and then you've got to wait, and then you've got to turn it back on, and it's, it's kind of annoying. So I don't want to use the BIOS the simple way to do it. Um, I could use Wake on LAN, or at least I could if this particular bit of hardware supported it. That's when you send a magic packet to the network port, and that wakes it up. So what I've done in this, which is what I've done in the previous project, and it works really well, is to solder a couple of wires across the power point, power button and run it with a relay. So I can sit back here and I can say turn on and the relay closes for long enough to turn this thing on. Um, the, the previous one of these uh, that I was playing with was actually rather unreliable. So what I, had, what I did was I took, the monitor, I took the hard drive LED output also from the front panel and I fed it into one of the digital inputs. 
So what I would do is I would fire the thing up and then I'd see if I'm getting activity on that pin. And if I'm not, then I know the thing is being stupid again, so I'll turn it back off and on again. So luckily this one doesn't need that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this is the kind of cool stuff you can do. Those pins are very, very flexible. Uh, do I use watchdog timers? Not on the BIOS. This is a standard desktop PC. Uh, I do have watchdogs sprinkled throughout my code and, and retries and, and that. That's actually one of the reasons I didn't disable the um, reset on RTS, to uh, on DTR toggle, because I want the PC to be able to reset the Arduino if the PC thinks the Arduino is not behaving. Um, there's my ultra mobile PC. Um, the little webcam that took the picture we just saw. It's an EE700. I'm running the EE Ubuntu 8.04.1. I believe that's easy peasy Linux now. It has one modification. These cables coming out here are wired across the PowerPoint, but in the same way as the PC. The Arduino and the um, Triple E are monitoring each other. Uh, Stoneth. Yeah, shoot the other node in the head. I'm not happy with, what, with what you're doing. Reset or I'm not happy with what you're doing. Turn your power off. So it does actually come in. Um, it, it, it is required because when the uh, if the system ever runs out of power, this thing of course shuts down. Uh, when the power comes back up and the Arduino decides I've got enough power to run the Triple E now, it has to have some way of turning the Triple E on because it won't do it by itself. So that one tiny little mod. Um, other than that, I use the USB. There's another port on the other side. I'm using the, you can see the invisible red cable leading to the other PC. Uh, it also has Wi-Fi, which presents some interesting possibilities if I want to start you know, having remote sensors or, or whatever. Uh, Bluetooth, whatever. Some of the Arduinos um, write, um, work over Bluetooth, so. Um, and Sigby. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of flexibility. Bucket loads more power than I actually need. And unfortunately, it also consumes bucket loads more power than I actually need. I looked at a couple of other things. Uh, so this thing, 9.7 volts between 1 and 2.5 and amps, depending on what you're doing with it. Um, I looked at the Kulu, uh, which is... Um, uh, a Linux appliance kind of thing, you know, you plug in your monitor and keyboard and fire it up. Um, the, the, the appeal of having a fully fledged laptop is it has a built in UPS. So that's why I didn't want to use a cooler because, you know, if, if I ever I lose power, it'll go down hard, whereas this thing here will gracefully recover. Um, yeah. Oh, um, the. Uh, the, the other appeal of this was it is high volume COTS, so it is going to work and if it doesn't work a lot of people are going to complain and we're going to hear about it. Because we've had various bits of hardware suggested to us to do various things in the past and as a company we don't have that much experience in that field so we've chosen non-ideally a few times. And I've just been shown a rather pretty picture of Linux. Yep, Linux stamp, yeah. Um, one of the other advantages of getting this approved is that um, if all else fails, at least it's not wasted because we can upgrade it to XP. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> if you say it quickly, it's like ripping off a Band-Aid. <laughs> The question was uh, more hardware mods to reduce power use. Um, for example, backlight screen. Uh, the, the screen powers off by itself after a while. Um, I really didn't want to do hardware mods because I want to I stay with defaults and unmodified and, and stuff as much as possible. And um, uh, there are lots of information on how to overclock these things, not much on how to underclock them. So <laughs> So, I mean, that would have been nice, but again, um, I'm worried about reliability, and if I'm sort of applying a third-party patch that lets me reduce the clock speed and it works 99.9% .9 of the time, then 1% of the time I have to drive out into the sticks and press the reset button. And 
unattractive. Uh, yeah, XO, I would love to use one of those because its power input is so much better than that. But um, yeah, there's one XO in the room and it's being protectively cradled. So <laughs> short of everybody looking away and me getting at a baseball bat, I'm not going to have one available to use here. So uh, yeah, but the XO is um, designed for this kind of homebrew, rough and tumble stuff, and it would be ideal for it. And if, if something like the XO with low power and decent power input was available, Lime it, PC. Lime, Lime PC? It's a little uh, pro scale power. Mm -hmm. uh, they make a range of products, including small ultra mobiles and palm tops and uh, media center type things. OK, so that was Lime PC, and they make a range of this sort of stuff and media center PCs. Using a uh, sorry the um, freescale. Free uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Another question at the back. How long do I expect it to last in service? Until the cows beat me. <laughs> uh, do you mean battery life or, or service life? Lifetime of the project. Um, this is uh, part of another project. I mean, it's cool and fun to work on, but it's actually supposed to make some money. So it's going to be used to control something else. So the lifetime of this is pretty much controlled by the other thing that we're doing with it. Uh, unless somebody in the audience desperately needs, you know, 100 of them, and then give me a call and uh, it'll have a great lifetime. So <laughs> oh, so, sorry, one more question. Yeah, very valid comment. If you wanted, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, very valid comment. Um, if you want a service life of say 10 years, by that time the batteries will be dead and you will not be able to replace them. Um, that's where you say, oh look, this EP, this UMPC doesn't work. I'll get another one. And that's why I want to do minimal mod hardware mods. So all I have to do is figure out how to, you know, wire two lines across the power cable. And you know, and, and and the new one will work. So it's all modular. It's all like, oh, I can't, you know, use this telco anymore. I'll use somebody else, or I can't use NextG. I'll use carrier pigeons. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, the service life of a con of a consumer appliance like this is nowhere near what you'd need for s for a project that's supposed to last a decade. So it's modular. You you toff it out and get something different. Um, How does it cope with extreme? How hot does it get? Um, how hot does it get in the in the shipping container? Uh, there is frighteningly little information on how hot it gets in the shipping container. Um, it could become an issue, and maybe uh, one of these uh, other devices will be a little bit more tolerant than that thing. Um, again, the, I'd love to use a triple E because you know dust and. I don't think it withstands cows. I have an obsession with cows all of a sudden. <laughs> OK. Um, the software, the world's ugliest CGI interface, provides a summary of what the system is doing, status, control, history, snapshots. And this is where I will tempt the fates and do a live demo. Yes. So this is. Um, that same status page being served live off the Triple E PC via NextG, via ADSL, via wireless, via a lot of other things, which one of them wasn't working on Monday. Um, we have, <coughs> along the left, we have um, status and control of the digital I.O. channels. Uh, the center, we have a quick summary screen. So the center, we have the analog to digital channels. We have a quick summary of um, what it's been up to. Um, the, the main thing here is the Arduino has a state machine that, taught, that is determined by the battery state. So uh, this thing tells me how long it's been in what state. It's, it's a quick little summary. And then we have um, a historical information of when it has changed states. Um, 
I've got some plots of various things that I get from the Arduino and, and other places. I have a snapshot button where I can, you know, activate the camera and take a picture. And I have a couple of buttons that I can use to remotely turn the, the managed PC on and off. Um, it ru everything runs in, in UT, um, none of this local time zone and, and pain and suffering when you have um, daylight saving come in and whatnot. So it's just UT, easy, simple. So, <coughs> oops, hang on, forgot. Uh, okay, so um, MRTG plots being pulled live off the Triple E. Uh, for those of you not familiar, MRTG is the multi-router, multi-traffic grapher, and uh, it was in, it ri originally intended to query routers using SNMP and, and such magic and give you a, an idea of your traffic. Um, it is really nice because all you have to do is throw a couple of numbers at it and it'll give you these pretty plots. <coughs> so what I'm doing is I'm plotting the various um, analog to digital inputs that I'm getting. Uh, I'm plotting the battery state of the Triple E. Um, the ACPI tells me about battery capacity and battery voltage. I'm plotting the uh, free disk space that I have available. And um, I've got that set to change color from green to orange to red if the disk space starts to go um, critically low. I'm plotting the, uh, the mode, this is the, the, the state machine thing, and I'm plotting the uptime. And uh, I tempted the gods yet again by, by putting in my slides, I have an uptime of, up to si of over 60 days when I didn't at that time, but now I do. <laughs> so, yes. Um, each of these plots is, uh, you click on it and you get a pause, and then you get a bunch of other plots. You have a daily summary. Um, each pixel represents five minutes, 400 pixels across. A weekly summary, a monthly summary, and a yearly summary. And these are really good for spotting trends. Um, unfortunately, it's dis just disappeared off the end, but Monday we had a stinking hot day in Adelaide, and surprisingly, the solar panel didn't work so well, because one, solar panels like to be in bright sunlight, but they like to be cool. So, <laughs> so you can spot trends like that. Um, you can spot, oh look, we had a couple of cloudy days, and solar panels hate cloudy days. And you can spot, oh look, I tore the system down to relocate it. So um, depending on the graph that you're looking at, um, it can give you a very good in indication of what your system's up to. This one here is kind of interesting. Uh, battery capacity. Um, the Triple E battery only lasts a couple of hours. So this one usually is either full or empty. So if you have a look at the um, statistics that are plotted under the graph, you kind of get an idea of your availability. So, um, you know, if the system had been down for a day, then, you know, availability would be less than 100. Um, it's been up quite nicely. That's 40% of, well, it doesn't take that into account. So once it's been running for a year, that'll, that'll be accurate as well. <laughs> so, um, uh, sorry, back to interface. This is the backup plan, which I didn't have to use. <coughs> that brings me to the software. Um, the Arduino runs the Arduino Manager, which um, takes care of charging the batteries. The Triple E runs an Arduino interface, which talks to it. I have the CGI, I have the MRGG plots, and I have some miscellaneous stuff as well. So um, the Arduino Manager programs come in something they call sketches. Uh, you get a little IDE. It's all Java-based. It's cross-platform. Um, you download it, um, you start compiling your sketches and whatnot, and download them to Tripoli. It, it all works surprisingly easily. Um, you know, you don't have to buy any special hardware, you don't have to have, uh, you know, uh, name escapes me, programmers or whatever, but it, 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 it all just kind of works, it's nice. <coughs> 
Sorry? JTAG. JTAG, that's the one. You don't, you don't need JTAG or anything like that. The one USB connection will do. Um, the manager is a modified version of, of kind of the first sketch I wrote for this, which was a simple DIO, which you know, takes commands and then changes states of things. And, and on top of that, this one also manages battery states. Uh, I've said there are, there are watchdogs all over the place. Um, if this thing doesn't hear from the um, EEE, then it assumes the EEE has lost power. It waits for the battery to be fully charged and then turns it back on again. Um, so that, you know, it's one of the watchdogs. Oh, um, 49.7 day proof. It uses a, internally it uses the millisecond counter. Um, the version 11 of the software, oh, sorry, 0.11 of the software, had a feature where they did some curious things and it actually rolled over after nine hours, which was inconvenient. Uh, version 12 of the software, or version 11 with a patch, uh, will give you the full 49.7 days. And um, yeah, I actually had the thing up on my desktop PC running for 49.7 days to verify that it would. <laughs> and it has since surpassed that again in, in the field, which is nice. Um, we have the Arduino interface. This is a C program, C++ program running on the EEE PC. The Arduino exposes one serial port, but I want to be able to talk to it from multiple places. So um, I talked to the Arduino, I talked to a network socket, and all the other bits of my code talked to this thing, the CGI, the, the power scripts, the allow me to turn the PC on and off. Um, you can even netcat to it if you want to find out exactly what's going on. <coughs> um, yeah, so this thing here grabs information from the Arduino, builds up a history list of um, what the states have been. So, you know, that, that great big long list and the CGI thing just came straight out of this. And uh, it has a hook script that it calls when there is a state change. And currently that sends me an email. So yeah, I know that the battery is charging or discharging or whatever. Um, I have lots of glue all over the place. I have lots of Perl scripts that get configured out of a file. Um, things like uh, to turn the PC power on, I have to connect to the network socket and I have to press the button and I have to let go and then I have to tap it again because well, the way I do it is when you press and hold the button, eventually the BIOS gets sick and tired of waiting for the operating system to do something and it just turns the power off. So the, the way to securely turn the thing off when you can't see what the blinking lights are doing is to press and hold the button for a long time. And then you let go and then you tap it again. So I've got a little Perl script that does that for me and I can activate that from the uh, CGI screen. Um, I have cron, as already discussed, um, to uh, check whether the connection is up and, and to try to reconnect if necessary. Um, I use screen quite a lot. Um, the ultra mobile PC runs on a flash file system which I don't want to wear out. And I also don't want to forego a lot of information. So what, I'm, what I do is, instead of logging lots and wearing out the flash or logging little and not knowing what's going on, I start screen and I just have everything dumping to the screen. And if I want to see what a service is doing, I go in there, I, t I attach to that screen session and I can see what's happening. Um, so, everyone familiar what, what screen is? There's a limited buffer on that though. Isn't yes, screen does have a limited scroll back buffer so you and you can increase it by a command and uh, uh, mostly, uh, it's been of interest what it's doing right now. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, that's that's useful. Um, auto SSH. Um, it's kind of a wrapper around SSH. Uh, I use that for all my um, tunnels, and I sort of tell it do that SSH thing and set up those tunnels. And when that fails, set it up again. And that works reasonably well. I mean, as long as I have internet connectivity. Auto SSH will make sure that SSH is running and that will give me my reverse tunnel so I can talk to it. Um, I've got the SSH reverse tunnel. I also have the one that brings me that um, web page or that populates the web page. Um, NTP, nice to know what time it is. <coughs> uh, 
I have some ACPI hooks on the Arduino, again just sending me email. Um, and I've done some UDEV uh, stuff. Um, I have two, two USB devices that both pretend to be um, serial ports, and then they, they all get assigned dev TTY USB 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And um, I wasn't quite happy with, well, when I plug them in this way, they tend to get done in, in, in that order. So uh, what I've done is I've used UDEV to assign them unique names when they come up. Um, the way it works is UDEV is, has a look at the identifiers of the device you've just plugged in, and it says, oh, by the USB vendor and product ID, I know that's a, an Arduino, so I'm going to create a soft link called Dev Arduino to point to it. And I don't care if it's TTY USB 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever, I'm just going to call it Dev Arduino. And um, that makes my life a lot more simple and a lot more predictable, um, especially in testing when you unplug things and plug them back in. And the old uh, device wasn't closed, so it allocates 5, 6, 7, 8, and, and yeah, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> Um, they did a lot, it exists the last time I did a big serial project with USB devices and it drove me up. Yes, I, uh, a member of the audience has shared his pain at not having UDEF available when he was trying to do exactly the same thing. And yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Um, especially if you have one of those wonderful UPSs that you know, the old-fashioned ones where you toggle a control line and it powers down, you think, I wonder what's on here. Oh, that was the UPS. We had five 485 buses connected by USB devices and two RS2, two buses. And you just never knew which one it was. So whenever there was a power cycle, I would sit there basically working out which one they were by testing each one individual interface until something worked. And then, you know, this is the time. Okay. Just just describing the hydraulic procedure of doing this, which involves a lot of uh, shelling into things and typing horrible stuff. Um, the circuit, uh, just uh, blowing up um, bits of that circuit to uh, talk a little bit about what they do. This is a solar input. Um, it, it has to protect the system. Um, lightning never strikes twice in the same place because once lightning strikes, that place just ain't the same no more. <laughs> So I have a high rupture capacity fuse. It's like a normal fuse, only more expensive. And in theory, when it blows, it really blows and, and doesn't arc across anymore. I have a galley mass night semiconductor and a metal oxide varista. The idea being, if a, if a big nasty spike comes in here, these things will short to ground, that thing will blow, and the rest of the system will hopefully survive. Hopefully. Depends on how close the lightning strike is and how big of a uh, kick you get out of it. Uh, there's also a line disappearing down here into the... How am I doing for time? Two minutes over time. Two minutes? Oh, shoot. Um, okay, so that's monitoring, and here is a voltage regulator, and here is a much better one because it's a peak power converter, and here is the Arduino power supply, which uses diode logic to power itself from the solar panel when available. <laughs> Triple E PSU, uh, digital I.O., buffering, flyback diodes, relay, Yep, tasers, same principle as uh, relay without a flyback diode. A um, couple of spare relays, analog digital converter, Zeno diodes, good, evil. Um, results, 60 days uptime, had a few close calls, especially on cloudy days. Um, if I hadn't relocated, be over 90 days. The occasional comms outage, including one Monday. I have full remote control of the PC, which I will not demonstrate for lack of time to do. Oh, you were wrong. <laughs> Okay, I have more time. <laughs> okay, um, to-do list, diesel generator, it is, in, it is on site. I have not been able to play with it, and that's the bit that worries me most, because if, you know, shorting those two wires together doesn't start the generator, then nothing else will work. Um, a new circuit to include peak power tracking, the, the bit about the solar panel and getting the most power out of it. Uh, a better battery charger, so I can go beyond 80% charge. Um, the Arduino Nano, it's um, what I've got here. It's a little friendlier to, to work with on a breadboard. It has more inputs. Uh, we're going to probably make a PCB uh, instead of um, horrible Vero board. Uh, nice Vero board. And um, yeah, alternate sources of power. Um, 
cloudy days really kill this thing. So, um, uh, you know, a generator of, of wind turbine or something. And in summary, I have an incredibly long list of people to thank. Um, uh, people from Linux SA, Kim, Carl, Quazzle, um, Dom, the guy from the office, my boss for paying for me to do this. And um, yeah, it's all up here. It's GPL3. That's me. And um, that's it. Um, how am I doing? <laughs> Thanks, Thomas, and just as a thank you, there's a small gift from the Linux Conf. Thank you.